Greetings uh, and welcome everybody. It's just about 11 a.m. in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we, I have the pleasure of welcoming everybody who joined us today for a very special webinar on a very interesting and timely topic. I'm Professor Tamar Chawishkil, coming to you from uh, Georgia State uh, Cyber Center for International Business Education and Research. If you are joining us for the first time in this webinar series that got started in April 2020, uh, welcome and come back again. Our webinars are on a, almost on a weekly basis on international business pedagogy topics typically, as well as research in international business and conversations with business executives, which is what we have today as well. And uh, we're coming to you on behalf of uh, Cyber uh, MSI Consortium, uh, a, a group of 10 cybers, national resource centers in international business, which sponsors this, this series. And, and today's event is actually uh, collaborated with uh, the very nice uh, gestures and, and sponsorship of uh, the cyber at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I'll say a few things about Manuel and his leadership there in just a few minutes. Uh, so we just a little bit of background on our uh, cyber webinar series. Uh, these uh, webinars are recorded. Uh, so if you would like to review it later on, they will be available on GSU Cyber website as well as GSU Cyber's uh, YouTube channel. And if you'd like to share uh, the video within your network, please feel free to do so. Uh, today's speakers have also made available for you lots of resources uh, for uh, us to be able to use in our teaching. Uh, so those will be mailed to you after the event. Uh, today's event uh, is a little bit longer than our usual webinar. It's a 90 minute uh, event. Uh, so we'll have a little bit more chance to converse uh, with our speakers. When you do exit the webinar at the end of uh, 90 minutes, uh, there will be, you'll receive an email with a very brief survey. Please respond to that uh, as we are looking for ideas for future webinars and your reactions to, to today's event. Uh, everyone except the panelists is muted in the webinar. Uh, so please use the uh, Q&A function for your comments and questions. And if, if you like to uh, communicate with our uh, wonderful staff, uh, Michael Wallace and Paula Huntley in the background, please use the chat function. Uh, so we will uh, also monitor uh, your comments and questions and try to address them uh, during the event to the extent that time uh, permits us. With that, let me come to the topic of uh, today's event, uh, very timely. Uh, so global payments in world commerce, e-commerce is obviously is here to stay. And it's a major part of our uh, new economy, new world economic order. Uh, retail e-commerce, if you looked at some numbers recently, is growing very rapidly. Something like $4.3 trillion worldwide. And if you look at some of the other uh, measures such as share of e-commerce sales in GDP is also substantial. For the world as a whole, it's about third of uh, world GDP. And for the United States, it's higher. It's about 42% of US GDP. So I don't need to tell this audience that we have arrived in a new phase of uh, global economic order that we call the fourth industrial revolution characterized by also digital trade, uh, digital payments, data flows, digital services delivery uh, are all parts of this new world economic order that we find ourselves in. And when we look at the trade and traditional goods and services, we see a relative decline of their importance in world trade, whereas digital 
uh, goods and services trade has been increasing steadily. Uh, today, digital wallets account for something like 30% of e-commerce transactions, uh, so, and it's growing. Uh, and of course, the recent uh, disruptions, the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated digital uh, trade. And we're gonna be able to talk about that as well today with our wonderful speakers. Uh, so digital, digital payments or cashless payments are about $6.6 .6 trillion last year. And many innovations in this arena, including mobile wallets, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, cryptocurrencies, and so on. But I won't say much about this because we have the experts to speak to us about this, these topics. So let me take a minute and, and very brief introductions. I'll apologize in advance to Manuel and, and Stacy for being brief, but we'd like to get going with the conversation here. Uh, I'd like to welcome, first of all, uh, Professor Manuel Serapio from University of Colorado, Denver. Welcome, Manuel. Manuel uh, has been a speaker in our past events. He directs the cyber at the University of Colorado Cyber, of course. He is also a professor of international business and international entrepreneurship at the University of Colorado uh, Cyber, uh, Denver Cyber. Uh, he is also the leader of the International Entrepreneurship and Digital, Digital Globalization Initiative uh, in the UC Denver uh, School there. And uh, that Manuel has been a contributor to the international entrepreneurship field for many years. He is the co-author of uh, a very popular book on international entrepreneurship with our colleague Antonella Zucchella and Birgit Hagen. I see, Manuel, that you have revised your 2018 book and the new version will become available next year. And we're looking forward to that. And Manuel is a regular speaker in our pedagogy workshops, which we will return to next year in Atlanta. Uh, you have led these workshops together with Professor Patricia McDougall Manuel, and they're always very well received. And of course, you deliver these workshops around the world as well. Let me also uh, take a second and welcome our second uh, guest today, uh, Stacy Espinoza. Welcome, Stacy. Uh, and uh, let me just say a few words about Stacy. Again, very brief. Uh, Stacy is the senior director at Visa, uh, where sh she leads the data and analytics strategy for Visa Direct in North America and Latin America. And Visa Direct is Visa's instant payment service and fastest growing product. Uh, Stacy's focus is uh, twofold uh, at Visa Direct. One, bringing the gap between the business and technical worlds using data and data analytics uh, to optimize uh, Visa Direct's approval rates for cardholders uh, worldwide. Uh, Stacy also serves as a lecturer in international business at UC Denver, and, and she's been also leading the development and teaching of a course there, which we will also hear about today. Uh, Stacy earned her uh, bachelor's in communications and MBA from Florida State University, and she holds an MS in applied analytics from Columbia University uh, in New York City. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Stacy, for making time for us uh, for this very interesting conversation. We're looking forward to that today. Uh, so Manuel, uh, let's get started. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kabushkil. You know, thank you, Tamir. Uh, greetings from Denver, the mild high city of Denver, Colorado. You know, to everyone here, you know, I see in the chat that we have attendees from all over the world, you know, from Taiwan, from Malaysia, you know, from Oman, of course, various states here uh, in the U.S. So welcome. Uh, I, I just want to acknowledge our partnership with uh, GSU Cyber with Dr. Kavushgil and your excellent team there. It is always a pleasure and an honor 
you know, to be working with you. We've been doing this for over five years and always looking forward to participating, you know, in the excellent workshops. Also want to acknowledge our friends at the other cybers, uh, the MSI consortium that, uh, as Dr. Kabush Gil mentioned, is co-sponsoring this. And also give recognition to um, my university, CU Denver, and our business school for supporting our work on international entrepreneurship and digital globalization. As Dr. Kabushgil you know, mentioned, the, this is a trend that we're seeing uh, that has been happening even before the pandemic. And the pandemic simply accelerated this. Uh, some of the consultancies note that the acceleration is about half a decade. Uh, we no longer have to wait five years because what we're seeing now uh, is really the acceleration and speeding up of digital globalization. Eight years ago at CU Denver, uh, we pivoted our programs, our international business programs to digital globalization. And by this, I mean the digitization of commerce, global commerce, the digitization of global supply chains and digitization of global payments. And four years ago, we doubled down on this and we hope con to continue our work in this area. What we would like to do today is to share with you uh, developments, trends, uh, important opportunities that's taking place in the global payments space. Just to add to some of the stats that uh, Dr. Kaboshkil shared with you, Ernst and Young estimate that the volume of digital payments uh, is going to be around $150 trillion. When I saw this number, I had to uh, look at it several times because it's a staggering number. Uh, of this, uh, 100, it's 160 trillion. Uh, of the 160 trillion, 150 trillion is B2B, about 2.8 trillion is C2B, about 1.6 trillion is B2C, and this is when companies are paying their own employees all over the world these days via digital payments, and 800 billion is C2C. So this just gives you an idea in terms of quantity what is going on, but even more impressive is the qualitative side, the innovation that's taking place, as well as the players that have emerged in this particular space. Let me give you a personal example. Later today, I'm going to go to my mobile phone and buy a treat, uh, a burger, uh, either from McDonald's or Jollibee in the Philippines for my sister's grandson. And uh, just from that mobile phone, I can you know, place the order. I can take advantage of their promotion. Uh, I have already participated in their rewards. And that order will be delivered uh, by one of their partners, you know, e either Grab uh, Delivery or uh, one of the delivery services there called uh, Panda. And payment is going to be made, converted from pesos to US dollar, either using my uh, credit card or one of the e-wallets uh, that people in Philippines subscribe to, such as GCash or Globe Cash. And what's even more interesting is that I'll be able to track the order when it's going to arrive uh, at the uh, target place of uh, delivery, you know, destination, and I'm going to know at what time you know, it actually gets there. Uh, to us, this is no big deal because, you know, we do this, you know, all the time. But what is fascinating to me is as I reflect on this, just about three years ago, uh, the way I did this was I called my sister and I said, you know, I'm going to, you know, get your grandkid, uh, you know, a burger from Jollibee and I'm going to send you money through Western Union. By the way, could you please send your driver you know, to, to Jollibee and pick up the order and just tell me how it goes. Now this happens in a very, very short time. What is even more impressive is once we tried placing the order here for fulfillment in the Philippines and placing a local order. And interesting what happened. 
they were able to do what we've asked them to do faster uh, in the Philippines. So, so this is quite impressive. And uh, things are happening seamlessly and also in a frictionless, in a frictionless way. So what we hope to do is share with you uh, what's going on in the digital global payment space. Our objectives are as follows, uh, to look at trends and developments that's happening in this space, to address challenges that companies uh, would have to deal with as they develop you know, global payments. And being as most, uh, mostly academics here, what we would like to do is give you a takeaway that uh, you can use in your courses. So we'll share with you what we're doing in our course and we'll share with you, as Camille mentioned, uh, resources in international business and you know, global payments. So my, my job here is to moderate the discussion because we're very, very fortunate to have my colleague Stacy Espinosa you know, join us you know, from Denver. Stacy works at Visa. Denver is the second uh, main headquarters of Visa after Forster City and Silicon Valley. And she's the expert. Uh, my job is simply to facilitate the discussion and raise some questions. Just to illustrate how timely this development is, I woke up this morning and my wife shared with me a piece of news that said that Visa was acquiring today you know, a company out of the UK uh, I think it's called uh, Currency Cloud or Cloud Currency. And just last month, they also uh, acquired a Swedish company called Think. And the inspiration for these acquisitions are simply to facilitate more cross-border e-commerce. And we're looking forward to, to that, Stacey, to hear more from you, you know, what's going on in that space. So let me turn this over now to Stacy. Stacy, if you can begin by just saying a few words about yourself and then maybe later about Visa. Welcome, Stacy. Certainly. Well, thank you both for that warm introduction. I sincerely appreciate it. And my, my course in partnership with Dr. Serapio has really been in the making for the past nine months. And I'll tell you, nine, nine months ago, I didn't know that I would be here and it has been the most tremendous and rewarding opportunity. So I don't take that lightly. I certainly don't take it for granted. And thank you to all of you for showing up today. I, I hope that you find this webinar very timely and valuable and fun at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can we see it? Yes, wonderful. Okay, well, just a brief introduction on myself and my two colleagues here did uh, really oversold me. So thank you for, for your flattering generosity. But my name is Stacey Espinosa. Yes, I am a senior director at Visa. I joined Visa in June of 2019, so a little bit over two years ago. And I am the what we call the geography lead for two regions. I have North America and I have Latin America. So two teams, two very diverse teams. And I am the optimization lead for our product called Visa Direct. So Visa Direct is the fastest growing product at Visa. It is all digital. Another term that we use in the business in terms of digital payments is card not present, which is exactly as it sounds. When the cardholder does not have physical possession of the card, the card credentials are on an app or you enter them online. That is what we call a card not present transaction. So it's exclusively in the card not present space. And what me and my team do is we try to optimize approval rates, which you know very well, whenever you do a credit card transaction, there's one or two message approved or declined. We optimize approval rates to the highest extent possible without approving fraud. So there is no shortage of the amount of robust data that we have at Visa to quantify that for you. In 2020, there were 188 billion transactions on the Visa network. Compare that to MasterCard, that's about, MasterCard was 113 billion. So we had about 60% more. So a very, very robust network. Um, a, a little trip down memory lane for me personally that I love to express, especially in front of an audience of educators, is my career has not always been in payments. I actually started in financial services in 2007. 
on the fixed income trading floor right before the financial crisis. So I saw the market at the previous high and really take a dive throughout the financial crisis and experience that working on a trading floor, which was an incredible learning experience. I then pivoted my career. I was in sales. I was in client facing sales and asset management. So I developed a really strong business acumen being in sales because you're client facing and you're revenue generating. But 10 years into that, I got a little tired. I was on the road about 200 nights a year. And I think I reached a pivotal inflection point that a lot of people experience. And I'm sure a lot of your students do as well who are in graduate programs. I wanted to pivot my career, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And that, that's a very, very hard question. And so what I decided to do is I wanted to future-proof my career and pivot into something that was industry agnostic. And what I saw at the time in asset management, there was a rise of big data, a lot of robo advisors, and uh, my clients who were financial advisors themselves, you know, were a little threatened by that. So I thought, hmm, typically business people or salespeople, they don't really have a strong technical acumen. So I thought, well, what if I was able to bridge the gap, use my business acumen, but complement it with technical skills to fill that void because the business and the technical worlds are converging at an accelerated rate. So in order to do that, what I decided to do was to go back to graduate school for a second time. And I was fortunate to get my MS in applied analytics at the wonderful university in Columbia, New York. So you'll see me, that photo on the right, that is me in front of the famous alma mater statue in, uh, on Columbia's campus, which is a big tourist attraction. I have no idea how I was able to be there alone, but that was taken I think it was in later 2019, right before the pandemic. So that's the picture there. And of course, just a little bit about me and myself, my, my better half, Alan Espinosa, my, my husband pictured on the left, the, the handsome guy there. Um, he is a graduate of CU Denver and the International Business Program and had a fabulous experience there. He too went back for a second master's degree. He is a lawyer. So I guess you can say we love school. And our, um, our, our family, of course, is made complete by our fur baby, our, our dog, our miniature schnauzer, Chloe. So that, that, that's a little bit about me. And again, I'm just so um, thrilled and honored to be here. So um, Dr. Serapio, I will, I will turn it back to you to start facilitating our great discussion. Maybe uh, Stacy, we can start with a poll here. Uh, sure. Just ask the audience here, some audience participation. Uh, what is Visa? What type of company is Visa? So we have uh, five choices here, a financial institution, a financial services company, a technology company, all of the above, none of the above. If you can take a few minutes and uh, you know, give us your choice, uh, pick one, and then you know, we'll tabulate this and uh, later report to you what you told us, what you thought Visa was as a company. Please take a few minutes. This is one of my favorite questions to ask and I'll give a teeny hint because I'm feeling generous this morning. So when we say what type of company is Visa, think about classification of the company in terms of sector and the S&P 500. And Mike, just let me know when's a good time to proceed. And, and Stacy, when you ask this question to your students, uh, do they struggle? Uh, what's been your experience? You know, I would say struggle is an accurate description. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that you don't really think about, but when you're given the opportunity to think about it, you're like, what, what, what is that? And I would say, and that my past experience, I usually get one answer, which is, the wrong answer. So I'm curious to see what this group comes up with. Mm -hmm. We are Professor Stacy. Definitely, we're going to get this wrong. All right. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, I hope it's wrong because then that helps with the explanation. But if it's right, that's okay too. Thank you. So while we're tabulating this, let uh, Stacy please please go ahead and tell us about Visa. Sure. Well, what I love to, when I, when I joined Visa, 
it really struck me and I see the poll results are in, but I'll finish my thought here. The whole idea of payments is a lot like breathing. And what do I mean by that? Well, breathing is essential to life. We do it from the moment we're born to the moment we're deceased, you know, multiple times a minute. And it's something that's seamless, that's automatic, that we know is essential, but yet we know most of us, including myself, we don't know much about it unless you're a pulmonologist, for example. Payments is a lot the same way. We transact and pay every single day and especially the past 20 years, the use of card credentials has grown rapidly. I mean, Sweden is virtually a cashless society. I know cash in the US is, is really becoming less and less and less. So we transact a lot of times with cards, but do we really know how it works? And, and most people don't know whatever happens every time you swipe, dip, tap, or enter your card credentials what goes on behind the, the network and how was all this commerce being facilitated? So that, that's what really struck me, but um, just about payments in general and of course, more specifically at Visa, but I'll turn it back to the, to the results of the poll. And yes, it is wrong. <laughs> so um, good guess, all of the above. That is, um, that, is, that, that, is that is expected, that is expected. But actually, and I'm going to go back to the slides, the correct answer is technology. Visa is a tech company. It is a tech company. I understand why a lot of people think it's financial because it is facilitating financial transactions, but it is actually a technology company. And why is that? Well, then the second question is what actually is Visa? And the answer, I spoil it right here, is Visa is a network, it's a network. So it's funny because you hear terms that are used as nouns, as verbs. So example, like I Googled that. Well, that's an acceptable verb, although Google is a search engine in and of itself, it's a noun. So same thing with Visa, it's like my Visa card. Well, that's an adjective because you can have more cards, but Visa itself is a network. And it is a network that facilitates commerce of transactions through multiple players in the payments ecosystem. The players are listed here on this side for your visual purposes. But for the purposes of our conversation today, I really wanna concentrate on two of the major players. The first one is issuer. So the issuer is exactly as it sounds. It's how do you get your visa card? Well, you get it or it is issued through your bank, which is the issuer. So you can think of the issuer as the consumer's bank. Well, then what is the acquirer? The acquirer is the opposite. The acquirer is the merchant or the business's bank. So whenever you do a credit card transaction, the payment is being facilitated. So the money gets transferred from the cardholder's account into the merchant's um, bank account also known as the acquirer. So there's lots of um, there, there's lots of steps in a payment transaction that does include processors, which we're not really gonna get into today, but it is amazing how many parties are in the ecosystem that Visa connects to facilitate 188 billion transactions in one year. And most of them come back with an approval or decline decision within two seconds. So, but let me talk about the importance of card credentials here. You know, what, why do we use cards? I mean, yes, it's very, very, very convenient. But what cards are, it, what we refer to them in the business, is they're guaranteed pull transactions and they're guaranteed by the authorization message, that, by that approval or decline. What does that mean? It means that whenever we see that approval and we sign our signature, that means that the merchant is guaranteed to, to get paid, to get paid. So that's why it is, it is so important because they, they know they're going to get paid. So an authorization approval on a debit card, what does that mean? It means that the cardholder has enough funds and their checking account to pay for the transaction. What does an approval message mean on a credit card transaction? It means that the buyer has enough funds within the issuer's given credit limit to make the transaction. And how credit works is obviously the issuing bank pays the merchant and you, the cardholder, pay off your credit card bill at the end of 30 days. 
So that's what the approval and the authorization messages actually mean. And I will pause there. Any any questions there, Dr. Serapio, or should we move forward? Yeah. No, this uh, I think provides a very good framework because uh, even though we're talking about you know a non-card, uh, the card doesn't exist kind of transaction, the the, the framework still works because this is yes. how you know payments is actually implemented. So it's I think it's very important you know for us to understand this and when we talk about this in the classroom for our students to understand that no matter what the payment is, these steps have to happen. It will just be different actors or it might just be some inter disintermediation you know, that's taking place. Uh, uh, if there are no questions and we can go back to this if you have uh, you know, questions, you know, let's talk about trends. Uh, you know, Stacy, sure. what, what trends do you see? Uh, both US locally, uh, globally, particularly cross border. What do you see? Sure. What are the most important trends that you see in this space? There, there are a lot, and I, I've limited, limited it to five. But the reason why I say there are a lot is because you can see from the prior slide that the payments ecosystem is very, very robust, and it's all facilitated by a payment network like Visa. So there's many, many, many players. So disruption and one for one ecosystem player can rapidly affect the others. So it's difficult to limit them, but I, I will speak to, to the top five that I would say industry cons consensus is are really the most relevant. So the first seems obvious, mass acceleration towards digital. And of course, we have seen that trajectory gradually increase over time, but what did the pandemic do? It completely threw it over the edge. So just to quantify that a little bit for you, so I said in the beginning, we really bifurcate transactions and payments into one of two categories, card present where there's physical possession of the card and card not present, which would be e-commerce and all digital payments. In 2019, card not present made up roughly about 30% of all transactions. In 2020, because of the pandemic, that doubled in a year. So your point, Dr. Serapio on COVID really accelerating things by about half a decade, by five years, that couldn't be more true. To see that in one year was absolutely outrageous. And really what we saw that rapid rise was one key trend is we saw new market entrants for the first time, the baby boomer generation, the now retired generation that has a lot of purchasing and spending power they were the most vulnerable because of the pandemic due to their age. So they were forced to really be in lockdown. And a lot of times they started implementing digital payments for the first time. And what happened is when you basically force somebody to adopt it, it becomes a habit. So you saw a huge flood of new market entrants entering the digital payment realm for the first time, which was absolutely incredible. Now, the question is, as we begin to normalize, whatever normal means, do, do we see that continuing? And I would absolutely say yes. I think when people, the convenience of digital payments, when it starts to resonate, and most importantly, when it becomes the new norm, it is very, very hard to, to go back. So I definitely think that trend is here to, here to stay. Another example I wanted to give in terms of max, mass acceleration towards digital, we really saw in Latin America. So fun fact about Latin America, it's the most urbanized nation in the world. So what do I mean by that? It means that for their population per capita, they have the highest percentage of people living in close proximity to urban cities. So public transportation is a huge way of life for Latin America people. Now with the pandemic, you had essential workers that needed to get to work. And we, we all were very cognizant about germs and washing the hands. So contactless pay, where you dip your card at the public transportation terminal, again, they were forced to adopt a habit. And when you get people to adopt a habit on a, on a transaction they do daily, guess what happens? They start adopting the habit in incremental transactions in subsequent ways too and that habit begins to stick. So the mass acceleration towards digital, absolutely. And the, the pandemic really spreading that 
of course, with new market entrants, and then again, just embedded habits like we saw with Latin America and public transportation systems, which was incredible. Um, shall I move on to the second trend, Dr. Serapio? Yes, please. And again, any questions that you have, uh, just feel free to post it uh, in the chat. Great. So um, second one, embedded fintechs are optimizing user experience across industries. So I get this question a lot. You know, what, what is a fintech? So a fintech is, is essentially a portmanteau combining financial and technological. Now it is a standard term, but I would say it's more loosely applied to startups that we've seen come to market over the past 10 years, where a financial component and technological component coexist. And they also co coexist with deeply entrenched legacy banks. So, you know, standard brick and mortar banks, good example here in the US would be Bank of America, Wells Fargo, what have you. But the key component of FinTech is that they really optimize user experience. So you can think of them as the user experience layer that make a lot of these digital transactions possible. And that's not necessarily just limited finance, for example. Like uh, we, we've seen a lot of digital banks pop up. The UK has the biggest amount. Um, they've got Monzo and Revolut, but Germany has N26. Here in the US, two popular digital banks are Chime and Varo. Um, those digital banks, with the exception of one, are not actually banks. They really partner with legacy banks and really their main function is to mitigate the friction points commonly associated, commonly associated with legacy banks. For example, you, don't know, you no longer have to go in person to open, a, open an account and fill out a lot of paperwork. You can do it on the app in five clicks. So it eliminates the friction. So most digital banks aren't actually banks. Varo is an exception. They, they did receive their charter and we are starting to see that become more common, but it is still not the norm. So I wanted to point that out. A second thing is keep in mind that FinTech is not necessarily limited to the financial industry in and of itself. When we talk about embedded FinTech, Dr. Serapio coined it nicely, things become invisible and frictionless. And a great example to really highlight that embedded concept are rideshare apps, so Uber and Lyft. So think about it. When you download Uber for the first time, you upload your card, your payment type, and then you never really see your card again. You use the Uber app to hail your card, you get in, you take a ride, and you leave. You never actually see the transaction. The transaction is completely invisible in the background. So that's what we talk about is embedded. It becomes embedded, seamless, frictionless. And that is applied to a lot of industries, not just financial, not, not just finance. Yeah, and, and St Stacy, uh, you know, we have some questions here, but I'll, I'll, I'll post them and, and Tamir, uh, sure. please go ahead if you want to raise them as well uh, as we go through some of this. And I know that some of the questions also relate to other points that you will be talking about. So we've, sure. we've heard the term fintech and tech fin. And the way I've seen it defined in the literature is fintech are actually financial company banks and financial services who leverage technology to offer new digital products. Uh, again, JP Morgan is an example of this. On the other hand, you have uh, uh, tech fins and tech fins are technology companies who use their technology to offer you know, financial products. So of course, Google, you know, branching out to Google Pay. But, you know, it's, it's used loosely, right? And, it is. Uh, we refer to the intersection usually of technology and finance and banking when we talk about fintechs uh, and or tech fins. Uh, go ahead, Stacy, with the uh, third trend. Sure. So I would be remiss if I did, acknowledge, did not acknowledge the fact that the rise of digital payments, yes, that does lead inherently to more fraud and risk concerns. And, and, and why is that? Well, let's, let, let's talk about what fraud is, for example. So what is fraud? Fraud is when a payment is made using a credential that is not the user's. So of course, confirming customer identity is very, very important and it's harder to do online, you know, there's hacking concerns in, in that 
type of thing. So really mitigating this or, or finding a systematic way to make fraud less is, is definitely top of mind for a lot of business owners who are establishing an online presence. Absolutely. So we can thank our friends in Europe for really leading the regulation here. So in Europe, as part of the as part of the second payment services directive, they have implemented now in the EEA, so the European Economic Area, they have what they call SCA. SCA stands for strong customer authentication. And what SCA is, is it really requires the user to confirm identity in two ways. So I'm going to walk you through an example of how that looks. So what SCA is, is let's just say you're making a purchase online at a merchant that you've never bought from. The minute you enter your 16 digit card number, that card number is, is, is routed and you, they know what your issuing bank is. Your issuing bank sends you a push notification on your phone and they send you that push notification to validate that you are in possession of a device that confirms your identity like your phone number, right? So you confirm that yes, this person is in possession of the device on file, great. So confirm that. And then the second layer is proof of information of something only they will know. So that would be like a password, but even stronger, even stronger is biometrics, right? So biometrics either for the face recognition technology or thumbprint to establish that that person has inherent something that is fundamentally theirs before the transaction can be approved. So we've seen that that rolled out effective January 1st in the EEA in uh, 2021, and it will be effective in the UK effective March of 2022. So now that Europe has made this regulatory, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the world responds. You may see some of that. You probably have experienced that in some capacity here in the U.S., but the key thing is that it's not regulated. Over in Europe, it is. So it'll be, like I said, interesting to see one, one start, how the other nations pick up. But of course, Europe, from a geopolitical standpoint, they have a lot more cross-border transactions because their area is more clustered, confined, the, ge the geographic territories of the countries are smaller. So it's natural for people to cross border all the time, day to day, perhaps. Here in the US, it's not as common. So you can see a greater need over in Europe. So they're, they're really leading the way there in terms of, in terms of regulation. Stacey, a number of questions here, I think will, will relate to some of the things you've, you've discussed and uh, you know, will discuss. There are a few things here that maybe we can answer you know, very efficiently. Uh, you know, going back to your uh, you know, first slide, you know, Visa processes mobile transactions too, not just mm -hmm. point of sale transactions, is that correct? Correct, yes. Yes, and then you know, th there was another question related to the amount of money that you can transfer again, you know, with the traditional ways or non-traditional, especially uh, if someone wants to transfer 500k, uh, you know, to a customer abroad, you know, that can be done now. And I think this is one of the key reasons why Visa and other banks are actually acquiring other companies, you know, to allow this B2B transactions. Is that is that correct? Sure. Are there li that is correct. limits? Uh, I think retail, there are limits, right? But, uh, uh, you know, are, are there any limits that uh, that companies would have to, uh, you know, deal with? Uh, in terms yes, of that, that, that's a great question. So when you're talking about payment, we, we call it payment volume in, in, in the business. So yes, you'll notice that with all card companies, there's different tiers of cards. So you do have consumer cards, but then you also have business cards. So in the B2B space, if there is a facilitation that would say, okay, 500K, which is substantial, that would be allowed on a, a business type of card where we say the velocity limits are higher because those recurrent transactions are expected. Now, we wouldn't necessarily have a limit associated with that on consumer cards because a recurrent transaction like that is not really expected and could be a fraud flag. So yes, there, there are different tiers in terms of cards based on how the trans, based on the use case really for the transactions. So yes, to, to help to help facilitate that in a proper way, again, approving to the maximum extent possible without approving fraud. Yes. Great. 
you know, uh, on your point about biometrics, one of the things that we do at the CU Denver Cyber is we take faculty to different parts of the world. Uh, before the pandemic, we've taken groups to China, to Hangzhou, China particularly, and we've worked with Alibaba. And uh, most recently, what we do is not just take them to, you know, the traditional, you know, uh, Alibaba.com or Taobao.com, you know, facility, but we take them to the futuristic experimental uh, facilities that Alibaba is developing. One of which is a hotel called FlyZoo. And in FlyZoo, you check in with your face, uh, you open your room with your face, you go to the restaurant and again, pay you know, uh, using facial recognition. And quite interesting, you know, you go to the bar and you order a drink and the robot prepares the drink for you. Quite interesting. And again, it's facial recognition. And I ordered a cappuccino and they were just playing tricks on me. And, you know, I have my face on top of the cappuccino. That just shows you, you know, what's going on, you know, right now. So they have these experimental futuristic hotels, which they call Fly Zoo. They also have, you know, the supermarket there uh, and the department stores there. Very, very interesting. So they're trying it out. They're, they're, they're trying to see what works, if there are going to be concerns on the part, you know, on, on the consumer. So as Tom Friedman said, in this case, guessing is dead. Uh, you can just observe for you. And market research uh, has changed also because of this. Uh, one question has to do with um, developing countries. If you don't have uh, a bank account, can you participate there? And I know you're going to discuss this under financial inclusion and what types of uh, acquisitions is visa making uh, and uh, without disclosing, you know, right. what are they going to make in the future? I think it has something to do with the importance of open banking. So please, uh, uh, Stacy, go ahead with the four and five trends. Sure, Th that's a great segue. Thank you, Dr. Serapio. So yes, uh, fourth trend, technology advances are incentivizing banks to keep pace with digital commerce. That's a mouthful, but really what we're talking about here is open banking. So open banking is a term that may not be as familiar here in the US, although effective July 13th, there was a lot of publicity that the Biden administration does intend to support open banking regulation in the US. Of course, it has not started, but we'll, it'll be interesting to see how that transpires. But again, we can thank our friends in Europe for being the pioneers here, but also, also Australia too. So what is open banking? So basically open banking requires legacy financial institutions to share customer data um, and do that and do that through what we call APIs, application programming interface, which basically is just computer connection points. So that, that, that's really what it is. And I'll, I'll take you through an example of what open banking is because that's the technical description actually showing an example makes it makes it real. But the, the whole point of it is to promote healthy competition within the FinTech space, all to optimize user experience for the benefit of the consumer. So, so let, me, let me take you through an example of what open, open banking would look like. So I, I bank with Chase. Let's just say I wanted to buy a home and I needed to apply for a mortgage. Well, probably the first place I would go to is Chase to check out their rates. And since they have all my data, they, they'd be able to tell me very quickly if I, you know, qualify or not. Well, as a consumer, I want to see what other rates are available at other financial institutions. So let's just say I went to Wells Fargo. If I went to Wells Fargo to check their rates and have them see if I qualify for a loan, they don't have my data. So I would have to submit what um, proof of payment via pay stubs, certain monthly statements, a lot of a, a lot of stuff that again is kind of friction that it, really the onus is on me to provide. So through open banking, basically that data would be shared so I could safely hop around to get the best rate and not have the friction of all the paperwork to to see if Wells Fargo would approve or reject. That's basically what it is. So taking that a level higher, what that does through open banking and, and shared data that, that really will help continue to spur a lot of innovation and, and the fintech space, again, primarily for the consumer's benefit. So they have more choice, but at the same time, don't have a lot of friction. 
So that, that is what open banking is. Um, I did wanna say that open banking in Europe, it is an opt-in feature only, meaning the consumer has to willingly opt in. It's not automatic. Not everybody, you know, your data is just not shared automatically. You have to specifically choose it. It's, it's an opt-in feature only. So again, uh, I thought it was really telling that um, the Biden administration intends to throw support behind it. We'll see what that looks like. But I did want to opine a little bit on this topic because in my class, what was so wonderful is to get the students discussing the issue of data privacy and how data privacy really differs globally based on a country's cultural preferences. So for example, Dr. Serapio, you alluded to China definitely more of a collectivist type of culture where the government has more control data privacy there you know they're more open to it versus the us a very individualistic culture a very capitalistic culture where there's less government and intervention so their feelings on it are different so very very interesting and let me tell you brought up a lot of great conversation within the class when we were when we were talking about that and last, let, let, I'll keep pace, financial inclusion. And thank you to the person, whoever you are, that, that submitted that question. Financial inclusion, I would say, based on feedback from my course, was one of the favorite topics that was discussed. It really resonated a lot with the students. It really resonates a lot with me. Um, financial inclusion is just that. Well, what we're seeing is we have people in emerging market countries that are getting access to digital devices. So they have the means to participate, but yet they don't actually have a bank account. So how does that work? And probably my favorite case study is M-Pesa, which is a, a, um, a payment system that originated out of Kenya. And I will conclude my remarks. We have a couple more things that we want to get to on the cross-border side first, but I will conclude with what M-Pesa has done and how in, in a country that, well, Africa, but then of course, Kenya within Africa has, you know, the, the highest, some of the highest, you know, fi financial, what we call illiteracy or unbanked or underbanked in the world, but how they created this ecosystem that is absolutely incredible. So I will, I will end with that kind of a keep you all in suspense. And then Stacy, there's a question on Bitcoin, and uh, we we oh, we yeah. uh, we expect this, you know, always when we teach uh, a module or a course, uh, this always comes up: digital currency, cryptocurrency. We we, mm -hmm. we will get there when we talk about you know future trends. But uh, let's look at some of the cross-border uh, sure. trends, cross-border developments. Well, um, so cross-border payments. So of, of course, you know, we're, we're all transacting across borders a lot more and digital technology makes that even more feasible. Um, but there's inherent complexities within cross-border. So now that you all know what an acquiring bank and an issuing bank are, the official definition of a cross-border payment is when the acquiring bank and the issuing bank are in two different countries. So when that payment is being facilitated, it becomes very multi-layered and very complex very quickly for the reasons listed here. But of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There's different scenarios that need to be accounted for like cross-border governance or conflict of laws issues. For example, you know, US, we, we can't actually, we're not allowed to send cross-border transactions to Sudan, for example. So there are countries on restricted lists and that could differ based on originating country. For sure. Um, other things, adherence to AML laws and regulation, which are very different throughout the world. What applies in one country does not necessarily apply to the other. And then, of course, you've got the foreign exchange issue and, you know, the complexities around that in terms of liquidity and fees. It's, it's very, very complex. So a mouthful to say that cross-border payments are, they're um, more expensive and they're slower. The, the, those, are, those are the two main, I guess, uh, friction points associated with cross-border. So to your point on, on emerging technology, I would say what a solution that is talked a lot about, I would not say it's mainstream yet, but definitely a lot of discussion is really um, distributed ledger technology via blockchain. So an immutable ledger that is completely transparent, that is unregulated, that in real time can be verified. Of course, that is definitely talked about in the cross-border space. So that that definitely is, is is something that I know. Visa's in a lot of conversations. I'm not at liberty 
too much to say publicly uh, certain things about it, but um, I would not be surprised if, if more potential solutions around that quickly start to emerge in, in, in the fintech space or elsewhere. May, so, um, uh, uh, Trey, yes, go ahead. If, yes, uh, if you can go back to uh, the previous slide, I think, uh, you, know, adding to, you know, adding to that too, what you're going to see in the cross-border space is that, uh, again, you know, companies will deal with the complexity and they'll deal with the complexity through through agreements, uh, again, through mergers, uh, through presence in different parts, you know, of you know the world. And I think what what you'll find here is that you know speed, uh, you know, will be key also. You know, transactions will settle much faster. And then another thing that you'll see here, as you pointed out here, is transparency. You know, that will you know that will also increase. Uh, because similar to us being able to follow when we ship a package to Federal Express where the package is, we can now follow you know, through with the payments, right? Uh, through various technologies, I've been reading up on it, you know, geofencing, but beacon technologies and all of these kinds of things. Uh, I, I'm sure we're seeing that already when we shop at Target, but you know, this is going to happen you know, in the cross-border space here. And one thing that I do in the international entrepreneurship class that I teach that always gets a lot of interest among students is I say, these are the challenges, you know, who is going to solve it? So I give them names of companies, you know, Alipay, WeChat Pay, Visa, Amazon Pay, you know, and companies from different parts of the world. And then students will come up and say, oh, this company in this country has actually come up with a solution for this particular issue. And this is what they're doing. Uh, which brings me to a very important point, which we will discuss later. Uh, I don't even pretend to know all of this because this is not really my generation. It's my students' generation. So I get them to co-create the class and it's just fantastic. You know, I learn a lot for them because they're not just teaching it or learning it, they're actually using. It. Uh, and so we do get more, more from them you know, by doing so. So uh, let's look at the, a couple of business cases, Stacy. Sure. You know, before we talk about the future. Yeah. Sure, so I did wanna highlight, so this is my product at Visa, Visa Direct. So value proposition of Visa Direct in the cross-border space that we have just seen completely. Um, I mean, we, we, we doubled our, in a year like 2020, where a lot of businesses slowed, our, ours did not in Visa Direct, um, it, it, it doubled. And so the value proposition is speed. So when, when I say speed, what do I mean by that? I mean that if I was to initiate a cross-border payment from myself to let's just say somebody in Mexico, that person has guaranteed, guaranteed access to those funds within 30 minutes. So speed is the name of the game. So what, how, how, are we, how are we able to do that? And, and why, why is that so important? Well, it's important because traditionally in a lot of cross-border transactions, you know, let's take Western Union, for example, the old school way, I mean, they do have an app now, but the old school way is you'd actually visit a brick and mortar location and you would either give cash or you could facilitate it from your bank account to the consumer's bank account. And that really is processed similar to a wire transfer. And think about a wire transfer. When a wire goes through, you don't have confirmation. You, you, you don't, you don't have confirmation. The only way the transaction is confirmed is on the receiving end when they see it hit their bank account. Well, again, that could take a few days. And what happens? if you accidentally, what we call fat finger, where you gave the wrong account number. How soon do you know that that payment's rejected? It's not right away. You don't have confirmation. So think about taking that transac transaction on card network, where, like I said in the beginning, you have an authorization message, you have an approval, or you have a decline, and you have it instantly so you know. So that transparency is key. So, and facilitating those funds, the guaranteed payment within 30 minutes, just so you know, and I won't get too into it, there's a lot of work that has to be done by my colleagues in what we call client readiness, or what we call implementations to configure cards to accept these transactions. And to accept these transactions, it's not carte blanche. It can be specific card holders at an issuing bank. 
So we work a lot with the issuing banks because every issuing bank has a different clientele. So it takes a lot of work from the configuration and implementation standpoint to facilitate these transactions. It does not necessarily mean that every card is enabled to, re to receive it. It just does not mean that. But in the event that they are, again, the important thing about it being facilitated on Visa Rails is that authorization. You get immediate approval or you get an immediate decline, which is nice in terms of transparency. So the merchants that we have partnered to enable these transactions on our card network rails, MoneyGram, Remitly, TransferWise. So um, we've we've partnered with them and it is it has been absolutely amazing to see this, especially, I mean, it was amazing prior, but again, really in 2020 where cross-border travel really stopped but you know, you had people that needed immediate access to funds. This was a way to uh, fill that void. And I'll talk, and I'm gonna to transfer to, to domestic. <laughs> so um, those Lisa, are some before you, uh, Before you yes. go, move on this, I just had a question. The remit is uh, uh, providers, uh, is that a limited list or is that something that you'll be expanding? So there'll be more choices. Uh, available to consumers? Wonderful question. Yes, we, we do actually have what we call a cross-border readiness team that does work with these cross-border merchants, merchants so we can get as many onboarded as, as we can. So yes, that, that is definitely be, being worked upon and work, worked upon globally, um, depending on where these merchants originate from. So yes, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of work and a lot of concentration in this space. And we do expect this merchant list to expand over time, absolutely. I suppose it goes to what you said at the beginning, developing the network, the community of these providers so that more people have access to more choices. But the value proposition here is just amazing. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you talked about the, the frictions, you know, with the, wire transfers. I mean, it takes about all of the problems, all of the challenges with that. So I think the Visa Direct uh, is, is a wonderful uh, invention, uh, innovation in, in this field. Thank you. And, and no, thank you. Yeah, Tamir, uh, Western Union is based here in, in Colorado and we love the company. They have supported us for many, many years. And one of the things that make them very distinctive in the past is the number of point of sale locations that they have. Their claim to fame is they have more point of sale locations than all the fast food companies combined. But that strength has become a weakness because of this disruption. So they have really very little choice but to play in this space, either as an innovator or, or an as acquirer. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be you know, a problem. And later when we talk about the future, we're going to talk about you know, scenarios such as this. Uh, fortunately, you know, Western Union and their leadership, they're forward looking, they're, uh, they, they get this uh, because unless they play in this space, it's going to be a problem. They can rely on regulators with the amount of money that you can actually, uh, you know, remit, uh, you know, through these non-traditional channels, but that too is going away. And so they really have to play. Go ahead, Stacey. Sure, thank you. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of use cases domestically that we've seen um, really just ramp up again, mainly out of need for the pandemic, but um, gig economy workers, that, that, was a, that was a very popular thing that I would say we're, we're still seeing in, in now into 2021. But when the pandemic hit, we had, for example, unfortunately, a lot of people that were laid off from their jobs, even temporarily, like in the hotels, for example, you know, laid off for about three months, but, you know, they, they, they wanted to, to work. And so, for example, you saw Instacart, DoorDash just rapidly expand and they needed, they needed drivers, right? So in theory, a person could apply to be a driver, but knowing that the work is going to be temporary, so it doesn't really make sense to set up a direct deposit. It just doesn't really make sense to do that. So with Visa Direct, we were able to pay these workers instantly for, you know, even if they just worked for three weeks, 
you know, they could collect their paycheck at a cadence that they wanted maybe once a week. And we could set that up very, very easily versus again, you know, the alternative of doing direct deposit where it didn't make sense. So from the, the gig economy or even expanding that out to just contractual workers, you know, handymen, for example, or women that are going to work on a project for just a certain duration of time, you know, being able to push money digitally to, to pay them at the frequency they want, just very, very powerful. And the reason why speed and frequency are key is velocity of money. So the velocity of money, the faster people get paid, the faster they tend to spend. So what does that mean? That means incremental spend lift and more subsequent transactions, which of course benefits us, Visa, because we do get paid on a per transaction basis. So we there's lots of data to support that, the faster people receive money, the faster they are likely to, to, to spend it and it results in more of an incremental spend lift, which is uh, pretty powerful. Another thing, uh, merchant settlement. So this is great for small businesses. A lot of times small businesses, what we say, they, they operate you know, in the red or their cash flow poor because they need to collect their proceeds from sales, but a lot of times they can't collect them fast enough to pay their overhead or associated expenses. So they're kind of cash flow poor for a while. What's nice is that, let's just say a, um, a local business, like a flower shop, for example, I mean, it could be any business you want, but rather than you know, waiting to, to receive um, the proceeds from their sales, they can actually cash out at the end of the day and receive the sales proceeds that they made, that they earned that day, so they can keep cash so that they can handle their expenses in a more timely manner as, as they come. So very, very beneficial for small businesses. And then funds disbursement. Funds disbursement is, is very similar to gig, gig economy, but what we, what we did, we did partner, this is official, we did partner with ADP. Um, this might be a little uh, too forward thinking, but I, I, I truly believe, and we've seen this now with digital banks, that the two week paycheck may be a thing of the past. Not, not, not right away, not right away. But you know, um, wh wh why can't workers re receive their money uh, digitally you know, after three days, four days? I mean, or at, at a cadence that, that, that is good for them. Maybe that cadence changes as they advance throughout their career, but why does it have to be a static two week time period? So you know, thinking of the possible of what can be done because of faster speed is, is really, really incredible. So this is definitely not an exhaustive list of, of merchants that we work with on the Visa Direct side, but it's just in, uh, to give you a, a flavor. Um, but before I conclude, I did wanna also mention Lyft and Uber. So that's, that's something that we've really seen take off. So think about Uber and Lyft drivers. They really drive whenever they want. Um, but let's just say on a Friday night, you know, they want to collect the proceeds from their ride that, that day. Well, through Visa Direct, they can do that. And so just the proceeds that they receive from that, that day, they can get pushed to their debit card and they have immediate access to those funds within 30 minutes. So very, very, very powerful stuff. So it's, it's fun to see all these use cases progressing and growing. Um, and 2020 was a very, very busy year for me and my two teams. And I, uh, it's, it's continuing to, to, to be so now. And even talking about new emerging use cases of how Visa Direct can be configured and implemented both cross-border and domestically is, is very, very exciting. Stacia, you make a great point here because the transformation that's happening in this space uh, impacts other areas as well. And you mentioned HR. So we work with a smaller type of ADP uh, in our program, and they shared with us an interesting piece of research. And they said that many of these gig workers given a choice, choice A, you get paid $20 per hour, but uh, you wait two weeks to get the pay. Choice B, $18.50 per hour, and uh, you get it right after you perform the services. What would you prefer? many of them choose option B. And so this is your point. Why wait two weeks? Why wait a month? And, uh, and so given you know, the HR battle that's taking place right now for talent, uh, not just again gig workers, but many other types of employees, this could become a differential advantage as far as total pay is concerned. Same thing with marketing, same thing with merchants. So this is you know, quite you know, you know, interesting. 
Uh, you have another business case, uh, Stacy. Yes, this is one of my favorites and it's it was my favorite, well, one of my favorites prior, but I'll just tell you this resonated so much with my students. So I, I know we're going back to what I mentioned as the fifth trend in terms of financial inclusion. And, and the case study I really wanted to highlight was M-Pesa. So M-Pesa is, is Africa's most successful mobile money service. Um, it provides digital access money for uh, millions of people that have access to a mobile phone but don't have a bank account. So let's talk about this, how, how this works. So you'll see in the, the illustration there, there's thousands of what they call authorized M-Pesa agents that are, that are sprinkled all throughout Kenya and now, now Africa as well. So what somebody could do is they could go to an authorized agent, actually give cash or so deposit cash in exchange for electronic money. And so the transactions are completed, no different than, you know, like a, a, a pen and then sending it very, very similar to a text message. So just SMS. So the person initiating the payment would do a secure pin. They would send the money to the recipient and then they would be notified via text message. And then that person really has one of two options. They could spend that electronic money at registered and pay some merchants via QR codes. So they can you know, keep it digital. Or if they did want to cash out or receive cash back, all they would have to do is go to another and pesa agent and actually receive the cash back which is which is pretty incredible and what i love about m pesa is the whole concept of innovation and we got into a wonderful discussion in my class about this so whenever we talk about innovation a common word you or phrase i should say is outside the box thinking thinking of something completely you know out of the norm and, and, and apply it to make something revolutionary well, M-Pesa did the complete opposite. They didn't think outside the box. They worked with existing infrastructure that they already had, which is amazing. It was almost inside the box thinking, leveraging what they had that worked within their country and creating a system that is now world-class in a very, very, very unassuming market. So then the whole concept of, well, what really drives innovation? You know, necessity is the, the impetus for all in, in, innovation, right? And here they saw a necessity and, and they made it work. And then you're seeing multiple countries follow suit, but really, really, really just incredible. So the whole idea of financial inclusion, and there, there's lots of examples I can cite too in, in Latin America as well. But um, again, you give people the means, they have the means, they have the autonomy and creativity to figure it out their own way and in a way that that works for them. And what's incredible is a lot of um, government support during the pandemic was actually facilitated via M-Pesa. A lot of contrary to Latin America and Africa, you have people that live in very rural areas. So, you know, even getting to a bank could take hours, you know, I mean, it's not really that that common. But you know, they can now just have it on their mobile phones and the mobile phones don't even have to be smartphones. They don't, they can just be more just SIM card, basic, just SMS technology and still accomplish the same thing, which is absolutely incredible. So um, financial inclusion was a topic that really, really resonated deep in, in my course. So I wanted to finish with that case study. Stacey, this is uh, indeed a remarkable example. A question here, did the M-Pesa network exist prior to this service coming online? Was, uh, I mean, is, was there already a network of merchants, for example, that expanded and added this service to what they already offer? So they, that's a great question. So it, it basically goes over the cellular network. And I, I want to say it's, it's um, oh my gosh, my memory is drawing a blank, but they used existing cellular, cellular networks. That, that, that's what they did. So again, mm -hmm. leveraging in, existing infrastructure, they didn't actually create a new network. They did not. They just leveraged what they already had. And then because QR technology, QR code technology is, is readable by mobile devices, it was, that was pretty easy for merchants to implement. So again, almost like a, a, a tack on to what was already there to help the electronic money stay within the digital realm. But of course, because Kenya and Africa is still, you know, a very cash-based society, 
still having the option if somebody doesn't want to keep it in the digital realm or the digital ecosystem, have a way to actually get the get the cash back through the authorized agents. So it's a create in, in a sense, it's a create of a marriage of physical infrastructure, the the agents around the around the country, around the around the continent, as well as the uh, digital. Uh, yep. So the the old and the new uh, come coming together and complementing each other to fit the circumstances that you just talked about. Thank you. Yeah, and, sure. and, and Tamir, it speaks to one of the things we talk a lot about in international marketing, which is the last mile. So it's not really just about financial inclusion, but it's also about the last mile. And in this case, the telecom companies, you know, have played a, a key role here in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and of course, you know, Africa. Uh, Stacy, what? Dr. Strapier, you went on mute. Yeah. Uh, what about what about the future? Uh, you know, let's uh, let's talk about the future. And and maybe to start, we have a poll. You know, sure. uh, we have a second poll here. You know, what are your projections? What do you see is the top trend in global payments? Top future trend in global payments. And again, here we gave you four choices: increased purchases in cryptocurrency, digital currency, increased regulation enhanced collaboration between legacy banks and fintechs and more omni-channel payment options, both online and in person. Yeah, if you can you know, vote on this, uh, you know, four options, we'll give you a few minutes to do this. Yes, it's always interesting to see what, what people think will be the way of the future. Of course, we, we don't definitively know, but it's just re really incredible to think about because the options really are endless. Um, and I, and I, I really think that the pandemic is, is obviously as tragic as, as it still is, um, as it still is. It's w one of those things in terms of digital payments is, is like I said, I mean, the trend was already there, but when you, when people are essentially forced to adopt a new habit and then maintain the habit for a certain period of time, it does become the new normal. So, and I know I already alluded to this prior, but seeing that, you know, it makes the future even more robust in a way, because even if we go back to a complete normal, whatever that's going to look like, the, the, these, these habits are entrenched, you know, we, we value we, we value speed, convenience, frictionless as, as consumer and just the amount of choice that is now available to us at our fingertips because of e-commerce. You know, choice is even more paramount, right? And then just to have quicker access and means to access variety of, of resources just so, so, so much quicker and then, you know, almost have payments appear and, and be, be ubiquitous. I mean, I mean, even with my Apple uh, Siri, you know, I can place an Amazon purchase, you, you know, it's just like, it's, 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 it's embedded. It's just, it just, it's, it just happens, you know? Um, it's, it's just, a, it, 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 it is futuristic. Just, yeah. And it's, it's remarkable, the, the innovations, I mean, there's just no limit, right, to new things coming online, but I want to ask a related question, and you alluded to this receptivity of consumers around the world to these new innovations. Uh, we will take a look at the poll, but my question is, do you see a more receptive uh, acceptance, let's say, in Africa because, they, they, because of necessities, uh, or the Asians are, you know, traditionally what we've seen, for example, the Asians uh, bought into the cell mobile phone technology much earlier than we did in North America. And, and you mentioned that Europeans are ahead in terms of regulation and, and, and government involvement. Uh, how do you, if you may have some, you may have some impressions of uh, receptivity to these new uh, solutions, uh, new ways of uh, e-commerce uh, around the world. And you may want to comment on that after we take a look at the uh, poll results. And, and Stacey, I, I, will, I will help with the uh, addressing this excellent question of Tamir when we get to resources, because I'll 
I'll identify some resources that actually address your question, Tamir. But go ahead, Stacy, with the good, good. Well, the poll results, well, so I didn't give a hint this time, but the, the, the answer is that uh, there, there really isn't a right answer. I think all are equally viable and there's probably many more that are not listed that may be even more viable. Again, only, only time will tell. But um, I, of course, it's, it's funny. I remember we had, I had a full module dedicated solely to the cryptocurrency space. And it was in the later part of, um, of the semester. And at the time, I want to say Bitcoin was, I don't know, 62,000. I want to say, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was that. And then of course, you know, the course ended and then it dropped by half. It's just very, very volatile. But um, the visa, you know, we're, we're in the cryptocurrency space. We have settled a transaction and stable coins. So stable coin is, you know, backed by or pegged to the US dollar, I should say. So it takes that volatility out. So I would say in terms of cryptocurrency, definitely a, a very good, robust discussion in class, but the, but the whole idea of it being an accepted means of transacting where, you know, the stabilization just isn't there. Like, will, will we have to see that first? And then the discussion really got interesting is because, well, in order to see that, there would have to be some regulation, right? But the whole point of cryptocurrency is that it's deregulated. So how, how, how do you rectify? And so it was just so great to see the students opining and articulating their point of views and the homework assignments and in class. It was just, it was just really, really cool. But um, I, I did want to, to, to answer your question and you, you bring up just su such, a, such a great point in, um, in terms of receptivity. So I have found payments to be so interesting, not for what it can be, but also the philosophical implications of it as well, and even more unintended consequences. And, and I'll, I'll let, let, let me elaborate. What is the price that we pay for convenience? You know, you see China, for example, with uh, Alibaba and Alipay. It's basically, it's a super app. It's an app within an app. You open it and you have access to Taobao, which is basically their Amazon. You, can, you have access to investing. You have access to your bank account. You have access to anything through one app. But that requires a ton of data sharing, which you know consumers would have to be okay with privacy, which in that government, in that culture is fine. In the US, it's more fragmented, right? We don't, we just don't open one app and then have access to many other things within the app. Each app is fragmented. Like if we want to buy a plane ticket, we go to the Southwest app. If we want to make a purchase on Amazon, we go to the Amazon app. If we want to buy groceries from Whole Foods, we go to Whole Foods. So it, it, it's, it's fragmented. It's not one whole ecosystem because here there's more of an individualist culture. So it, it's funny because we all want convenience, but from a, global perspective, what, what is the price that consumers are, are, are willing to pay for that? And what was so interesting is we further got on in my class, we got deep discussions of like, well, if things are too convenient and we can buy anything at any time and the payment almost happens in the background, what, what are the unintended consequences? Could that potentially leave certain people vulnerable to overspend, which maybe that is not good for their financial health. And whose responsibility is that? I mean, it's easy to say on the surface, well, of course it's the individuals, but if it's enabled so much and it becomes a consensus norm, you know, what, what, does, what, what does that mean? And I am very passionate about topics like that because I think that they're not really discussed enough Granted, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but nevertheless, they're very, very valid questions that can impact happiness, way of life. So I think that's just so interesting. And uh, we got into some great conversations and great homework assignments. What my students wrote, it, 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 was, it was just unbelievable. It was just so fulfilling for me. And Stacy, I think this is a good Interesting. I mean, just a very short comment here. Thank you so much, Stacy, for responding to that. It seems like uh, each of us needs to make those trade-offs on a personal basis. 
the trade-off between convenience and privacy, for example, uh, convenience and cost. And, and you're saying that at the end of the day, it, it, it goes down to that trade-off and society's willingness to make those trade-offs. In the US, as you pointed, we pay more attention to data privacy. We're more concerned about our sharing our information with a very large network uh, whereas in China, for a variety of reasons you pointed out, it, it's it's different. Thank you so much for clarifying. I can I can see what an amazing discussions uh, this does lead in the classroom and different different opinions coming up. Thank you. Yeah, just Thank uh, you. a couple of minutes. I just want to call attention of the audience to uh, what we've prepared for you for those of you who have attended, and uh, so let me just. Uh, uh, or maybe Stacy, I can just have you, uh, you know, share that screen that uh, talks while, while I'm talking, that looks at the various resources. We put together for you a resource guide that lists books, uh, consultancy reports, company reports, uh, also shared with you the course outline that we put together for the course of Stacy. So have a look and, you know, let us know if you have you know, any questions. So for example, uh, Tamir, your question about receptivity, it's not just among countries, it's among generations. And so what the pandemic has done is accelerated or force the adoption of the older, the older generation uh, uh, to this new digital globalization, you know, platforms, because they have little choice. And when they tried it, they discovered that it was not that bad after all. It, it was not that difficult. And companies are actually making it you know, less difficult as well. So these, is, these are the uh, uh, you know, resources. You can just flip through it, Stacey, uh, uh, you know, very, very quickly. These are the books. Uh, go ahead. This, uh, you know, these are more books. And then we have consultancy reports uh, you know, that we've shared with you. If you're just going to read one, read the one uh, that was issued by Global Payments uh, and also the one by you know, Accenture uh, because they're great. One by McKinsey is good too, but they, they, they took a dimmer view on this because they wrote it while the pandemic was going on. And then you know, we have uh, articles that you can actually go to uh, and read. Uh, and so let's just go to the end, Stacy, to your course. Uh, and have you comment a little bit about, you know, your course and the various modules that you have. We have videos for you, you know, too. So, yeah. Sure. Let me go and switch decks here. Yeah. And and you know, Stacy's course is fifteen weeks. What's also very interesting here is that while students were taking Stacy's course, they were also taking a course that we have developed together with IBM on blockchain and emerging technologies. Uh, in the global supply chain. So it was a very nice, very nice compliment. So this is your course, Stacey. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. It's uh, not pulling up the right one. Give me one sec. Okay. Uh, and and is this course, what are the requirements for the students? I mean, at what stage of their studies do they come in, uh, in into this course? Uh, what they, are the prerequisites? They take it usually after they've taken the uh, fundamental courses in international business, intro to international business, international entrepreneurship, some of the functional courses. And uh, so what we hope to do is offer this as a bolt on uh, for other programs too. Because if you're doing BANA, uh, you know, and you're not doing global payments, uh, it, you're missing, on, missing out on a very, very important development and a very important applications. Go ahead, Stacey, I know we just have a couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. Sure, yes, and I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. So yes, th this is the, the module of the 15 weeks that, that we had. So I would say definitely ones that, that resonated were comparing payment systems across the globe. So in that module, we really talked about Alipay and then we talked about M-Pesa to really um, highlight the differences and existing country pulse check in terms of cultural differences, but also geopolitical differences, data privacy differences. It was, it was really, really interesting to talk about that, but we, we talked about a lot of them and you know, a lot of the students didn't really know 
um, how different payment systems work throughout the world and, and how, how much really goes into that. Um, of course, definitely the cryptocurrency, the blockchain and AI, uh, that one was, was great. And that one is, it's so current. I mean, there's really no set resource. If you buy a textbook, I'm sure the information is great, but six months later, it's, it's largely outdated. So what's so great about this course is that although I did have um, some books that I referenced, a lot of it was just current event articles that I just picked up throughout the, the pace of the course. But also, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to leverage a lot of the white papers that are published by Visa. I have to give kudos to competitor MasterCard. They have some great stuff as well. So incorporating all those into the course um, on a week by week basis definitely, definitely resonated with the students. And again, an, an, an unexpected surprise that I think I concluded with is, you know, just the, the deeper conversations that, that come up organically, and I, I mentioned in the philosophical sense, but um, that, that really just come up and, and see how the wheels in their head just, just spin and how they, they were able to articulate and debate and, and in a safe setting, but also just made them think a lot deeper about the subject matter and what it means to them. And that for me as, as a first time adjunct lecturer was, was so, so meaningful. It, it really was. So um, I did also, again, I, I have um, access to just amazing colleagues. So I did bring in three speakers and of course my network at Visa continues to grow. So I definitely um, expect to do that in subsequent semesters too. So I can't even tell you how much of a positive life-changing experience it was for me. Um, I, it's funny that the, the, the students come to learn, but it really was me the one, I was the one that, that, that learned and probably gained the most and I'm so fortunate. Yeah, we will mail this to you. We will, uh, GSU will email it to you. Uh, we will also update this if you have any suggestions, uh, what we should include, please let us know. Uh, this will also be in the website of CU Denver Cyber. And we hope, Tamir, next year when we can do this in person, let's do a faculty development program uh, on, on global payments. I'll turn it over to you, Tamir. Stacy, thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you. Here into the thank audience. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I want to thank you both uh, tremendously, really much appreciated. And there's much appreciation from our participants as well. We had over 100 people join us today. There's a lot of expression of uh, praise for your, uh, for the knowledge that you have shared. I mean, it's been remarkable. It's been a learning journey for me. I would love to be in your class, Stacy. I can see the excitement that your students have uh, in your case. But this was very, very helpful, very educational, very instructive, and we cannot thank you enough. Uh, so we, uh, again, and, and look forward to uh, hosting you, Stacy and Manuel, in a future webinar too. I hope you will make time for that as well. So we will conclude our uh, webinar today. Thank you for joining us. When you do exist a webinar, uh, there will be a short, uh, uh, survey question, please respond to that. As Manuel said, the resources, and they're very rich, they're very helpful, will be available to you uh, from Georgia State Cyber as well as uh, University of Colorado Denver Cyber. So thank you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Fantastic, Stacy. Thank you very much.